Today is an anniversary. Uh, 53 years ago today. Uh, show the side, please. Technology works great when it works. 53 years ago today, Martin Luther King stood on the uh, steps of the Lincoln Memorial and gave his now famous I Have a Dream address. And I thought about how desperately we need somebody like Martin Luther King today. I, I know they're there. And I have been praying that God would just call somebody who could stand up and lead us to a higher calling, who could lead us to a peace and respect for each other and rescue this out-of-control nation. Oh, Lord, we need another Martin Luther King. Our world is crumbling. Evolution is built on the premise that everything is getting better. That through changes and death and trouble, things are moving to a better outcome. Creation, on the other hand, the premise is that things were the best they could possibly be at the beginning. And since then, they have been deteriorating. I make no apologies for being a creationist. I believe God started this whole process and it was perfect in the beginning and what we see today is the result of sin as it's falling apart. Violence and corruption are epidemic. Just look around for a nation of people who are living at peace with God in righteousness and you cannot find one. I am not saying that every human being on the face of the earth is a wicked, violent person. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just simply saying that you look for a nation of people who are living at peace with their God and in righteousness before him, and they don't exist. The world is dark and getting darker all the time. In fact, the darkness is increasing at a more rapid rate than ever in my lifetime. It's encompassing us. The rate at which it has happened is exponentially increasing. I remember from my Bible study that a prophet who lived a long time before Jesus, several hundred years, said there's coming a time when right will be wrong and wrong will be right. So we were warned that this was coming and we certainly are there today. The good news is that those of us who have been born again are citizens of a different world. Unfortunately, that's the good news. The bad news is we're living in this one. And our job is to be light and hope in the darkness. It isn't our job to see the approaching darkness and then run and hide somewhere in a cliff, wait, or I mean a cave, waiting for God to come get us. He expects us to be the light that this world needs to find their way out of darkness. <laughs> However, if you're like me, you might be praying something like this. How long, oh Lord, do we need to endure this? How long, oh Lord, before you make things right? How long, oh Lord, do we have to put up with the heathen? <laughs> I remember the old black preacher who, uh, who said, uh, why do the heathen rage? Because they are heathen. And I want free from it. And there's nothing wrong with me wanting free from it. There is something wrong with me retreating from the darkness. As if the darkness is stronger than the light. As if the darkness is winning because in a believer's life, the darkness never wins. There is not enough dark to put out the light, ever. I want to read, for, uh, but uh, let me. 
I would like for all of this to end. I know where I'm going, by the way. My doctor keeps wanting me to take medicine to make me live longer, and I finally had to tell him, I said, Doc, I don't want to live forever. I know where I'm going. Uh, you know, enough's enough. I mean, I'm not rushing. We've had a tough week, and it's not getting any easier. Uh, Friday, we had a service for Jennifer's stepmom, Deborah Ashley. Following the internment at the cemetery, I drove directly to Richard and Denise's. We gathered around the bed with Richard and Denise, and uh, we prayed. And Richard says, I'm, I'm tired, I'm uncomfortable, I'm ready to go. And so we prayed, and I, I'm, I'm one of those guys who, uh, because I am, a, uh, I believe the Bible to be true, and I believe God is sovereign, you know, I'll, I'm always praying for God's will to be done in every situation. My wife, however, having heard Richard's desire, simply said to the Lord, Grant his desire, Lord. In the morning, we left talking about how much longer we felt Richard had, and we actually thought that he was going to live uh, uh, quite a while longer. That was us. And instead, I get a call from Kim, who's weeping and saying, Richard has passed, he's gone to heaven because somebody shared the gospel with him and he believed the gospel and so now he's a believer in the presence of God I, I came away from that thinking man my wife's prayers are being answered right there I hope she doesn't pray that prayer for me <laughs> she gets mad at me sometimes but I was focused on the end and so I'm gone to the very last chapter in the Bible, and I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, surely I come quickly. Let me read uh, the last part of the Bible, which is beginning in Revelation 22, verse number 7 through verse 21. And I have the English Standard Version with me. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, not me, John the Apostle, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me or showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. With those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of this prophecy, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still be right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are dogs, sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. 
And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which he described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, into your hands we come today, humbly acknowledging that you and you alone are worthy of our full attention and our worship. Come to us each individually. Work in our lives for those who are doubters. Express yourself so they can know who you are. This is an exercise in futility without your help. So help us today. In the name of our Savior and your sweet Son, Jesus our Lord. Amen. I want to focus today on that phrase, surely I come quickly. I just said that it was, it seems as though things are crashing in on us. And I pray this prayer, come Lord Jesus. Uh, Rick used the terminology Maranatha, which means come quickly, Lord Jesus. You know, we're ready. Uh, let's, let's, let's have this whole place in. And that's really what I want uh, my prayer to be. But what I realize is if, if I'd have gotten that prayer requested to uh, answered yesterday, you wouldn't hear what I was saying today. And somebody in this room may very well need the truth that is being spoken today. So where we want this to be over, where we want our lives to be with Christ, transformed, not sinning, standing in a grace that is not our own. Thank you for that beautiful song. Where we worship forever the one who is worthy of worship. We understand we have a job to do, and that is to bring the light to bear and the gospel to bear in this dark world. So, I can tell you that there's no doubt about it. The book of Revelation has some very strange and hard to understand things in it. However, the passage I just read is not hard to understand. It's pretty clear. Jesus said, I did all of this so the church would have messages, and now I'm just telling you I'm going to come quickly. <laughs> and you might say to me, John, it's been a long time since John stood in the cave on the Isle of Patmos and got this, and you're absolutely right. It's been a long time. For humans, God doesn't know time. In heaven's time, a couple days. Didn't the scripture say a thousand years are like a day and a day is like a thousand years? So if we were looking at heaven's time, it's only been a couple days. He said, I'm coming quickly. First of all, I want you to see the relevancy of the message we just read. The relevancy of the message we just read, and that's found in verse number 10. It requires a little bit of explanation, but the angel is telling John the story and the message comes from the Lord, don't seal up this message. Now, without an understanding of the Old Testament, uh, you might miss what's happening here. But the Jewish audience that was getting this, even the Jewish Christian audience that was getting this, they knew exactly what was the comparison here. Because back a long time before Jesus was born, there was a guy named Daniel. We know him because of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel was an exile in the nation of Babylon. He actually went through a couple, three uh, uh, power changes while he was there. He was a prophet, sometimes in great honor and sometimes just pushed off to the side. But he also got a prophecy about the end, and there was a lot of cryptic stuff in it. In fact, the message Daniel got describes the four world powers that have owned the world. They're all there. They're used, uh, they're described by an animal, but uh, you look at them, you just understand that. That's not my message. But at the, he gets it all, and Daniel's confused. He says, what is all this about? And the messenger, the angel that's given him the message, said, don't worry about it. Seal it up to a different time. 
to a later time. And he gives us two clues about when that time was. Number one, knowledge is going to explode. And number two, travel is going to be great. People are going to run all over the world back and forth. And we are living in a day when travel has exploded all over. In fact, you and I can get on a plane and go anywhere within less than a day. We can go around the world. We can go to Australia. Uh, the flight from Sydney to uh, DF, I mean to LA goes about 18 hours or 60. I, I don't want. I'm not saying line up because anybody gets on a plane for that long needs drugs. <laughs> Good kind, not bad kind. <laughs> but we travel all over. I heard the other day that n knowledge is exploding at an exponential rate. We, we are learning what we learned in a decade now in five years. And it is just going crazy. So it's the day for his message to be understood. And when John gets a message, the, the messenger, uh, Jesus is saying, don't seal this up because it's for now. So it's relevant to you and me today. Even though you think, well, it's been a long time ago, the point is, once John got that message, a clock started ticking, and the end days are upon us. They are working from the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ till today. We're in the last days, and they continue to march on. We are living next to the Broadway. The Bible is very clear. There are only two roads people travel on in life. One is very wide and has the most people on it. One is very narrow and has a few people on it. And you and I as believers, as people of the light, are next to the Broadway as millions of people are passing by us every day, enjoying the trip, enjoying the company without a clue that the end of the road they are on is destruction and we are to be the signpost that says... Get off that road. The end is coming. I remember when I was growing up, that guy always had a black robe and uh, sickle and carrying this. And yeah, no. We're not to look like that. I do remember a guy, uh, a, a guy standing, uh, the end is near, sign standing like this. And, and people laughed at him going around the curve until they realized the bridge was out. The bridge is out. People are traveling a road that they're enjoying the trip. But the end is destruction. And the, and the lies coming from the enemy, Satan, is it's not so bad. There's no urgency. There's no, there's no real reason to worry. Just have a good trip. They're traveling straight to hell and don't even know it. And so you and I are the ones who should be standing there saying you're on the wrong road. You need to change roads. He says, I come quickly. The six times in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, surely I come quickly or I come quickly. Three of them at the beginning and uh, three of them at the end. <clears throat> surely, confidently, take it to the bank. I'm coming. We just talked about the promises of God are amen, are true in Christ Jesus. God cannot lie. They will, in fact, happen as he says it will happen. There was a preacher who was preaching, and unlike me, he didn't take notes into the pulpit. He memorized his message, and so he got up there. And anybody who's ever spoken, anybody who's ever had to speak publicly, anybody, any kid that's ever done an oral report, he got behind the pulpit and his mind was completely blank. He didn't know where to start. Sometimes all we need is to start, right? And when you've memorized something and you're struggling because you can't quite get it out and somebody throws out the first word, you just take off. So he knew what his title was. His title was, Surely I Come Quickly. And so he stood behind the pulpit and he says, Surely I Come Quickly. He figured if I repeat my title, it's going to start flowing for me. And nothing happened. So we got louder. That's what we do when we're frustrated. Surely I come quickly. And still nothing. 
just total blank. Finally, he was exasperated, and he just leaned over the pulpit and shouted, Surely I'm coming quickly! And at that, the pulpit gave way. He tumbled over the pulpit, landed in the lap of an old lady who was sitting in the front row. Frustrated and embarrassed, he got up, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. She said, that's all right, you gave me plenty of warning. <laughs> the warning is, he's coming, and it's going to be quick. Could be talking about how soon he comes, I just told you, it's like two days in heaven. Or it could be, he's there, you know, rapid arrival. He comes in two ways according to the way he uses this terminology. The first one is in judgment, and it's found in the early part of the book. In fact, there are two places, Revelation chapter 2, 5 and 2, 16, where he says this very same thing, I'm coming. Here's what he says in verses, or verse number 5 of chapter 2. You know that the, the, first, or the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation are all individual messages, seven real churches that uh, were in Asia Minor. So it's just like the Marshalline Baptist Church, only it was the church at Ephesus and Thyatira. They were real churches with real people, just like us, who were going through their lives trying to please God, doing all this. And he, he, he addresses each one of those churches, and, and he gives them attaboys or straighten up kind of message, sometimes both. And uh, in chapter 2, verse number 5, it, he says this, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen... Repent and do the first works or else I'll come unto thee quickly and will remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. That was a church he's talking to and he's talking to a church that lost its way. I mean, they were, they were sound doctrinally, but they just lost their zeal. They lost their love for Christ. They weren't reaching their community the way God wanted them to reach it. And they were just going through the motions instead of having passion. And Christ is telling them, you guys got to change, change the way you think and change what you're doing or I'm going to blow out your candlestick. That means the church won't exist anymore. Do you know how many churches there are that don't exist anymore? I don't know how many have been to Europe. In Europe, churches are everything but churches. A lot of them are pubs. Some of them are auto mechanics. There are all kinds of different things that they use churches for because at the point in Europe where they once were the heralds of the gospel, the source of passion for reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they could care less now. We actually, they, the missionary society started by Europe, sent to the world to bring the gospel to people in the world, are now receiving missionaries there. We had one not long ago who was here. His name is Joshua Bell and his family are going back to London to try to reach London with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because... Their candlestick is out. The second one is found in verse number 16. It's a different church. And he says these words, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, whenever you see the Lord Jesus talking about the sword of his mouth, he's always talking about the same thing, and that is the word of God. The word of his mouth is, in fact, the word of God. Christ is the incarnate word. This is the written word. They are one in the same. And he says, I, I, if they don't change what they're doing, if they don't repent and redo what they're supposed to, I'm going to come and fight against them with my word. These are individuals, not a church. So the truth of God's word is what a church loses first. The solution to both is the same thing. Repent. Change your mind, change your actions, begin doing what you used to do. And then the, the focus of our the rest of our message is on the fact that he is coming to remove the darkness, the sin, the stain, and the tears. And that we find in this passage of scripture that we went through. Today would be a good day. We've had enough sadness. And I can tell you with what we've had so far... 
we have looming, family members looming the same kind of result. Right now, our church, we have people in our church who are facing the same kind of, Joanne's grandpa, somebody she loves dearly, is on hospice. Connie, Pat's sweet sister, is just waiting for the end to come. I want all of the death and sadness in our world to end. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Put an end to all of this. I think John, after hearing all of the awfulness about what was going to happen during the tribulation period, just needed a little bit of encouragement. You know how it is when you just get bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news your heart begins to be heavy laden with that and you're it's like a cloud like a blanket that just kind of covers you and weighs you down I'm thinking John listened to all of that information about the the horribleness of the tribulation and he just needed a little cheering up and so the Lord reminded him hey I'm coming quickly and I'm going to put an end to all this. It's, it's going to happen. We don't have to worry about whether or not it's going to happen. Verse, 20, or verse 7 of chapter 20 says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of this book. I want a blessed life. And if I want a blessed life, then I should live in obedience uh, before the Lord. Keep the sayings of the Lord, be obedient and faithful before, before him. In Revelation chapter 22, verse number 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I will give to everyone. I'm going to recompense. I'm going to supply everyone uh, rewards according to their work. They don't get to go to heaven because they worked. They get rewards because they worked. And so he promises all of those who are faithfully serving God in the midst of difficult, dark times, who stay faithful to him, who are following him, hey, I'm coming. I'm coming pretty quick. And when I come, I'm bringing with me the rewards you're going to get. I don't know what they'll be, but I do know I want them. So in the face of all of the darkness and all of the oppression and all the stuff that's going on, I don't want to quit. I want to keep doing what he's asked me to do because I'm looking for something in his hand that's going to go to me. And then in Revelation 22, 20, he which testifieth of these things says, surely I come quickly. That's the final word on the issue. He's coming. He could come today. It could be all over. You could, this, this could be your very last time to hear the word of the gospel or to hear the encouragement from the written word of God. The next voice you hear could be the Son of God speaking to you. Welcome home. We don't know. It'd be great if we could say that only old people die. Well, it's not so great for the old people. I'm 70. Not so great for me. But death is an equal opportunity destroyer. Deborah, 54. Richard, 53. Are you ready? You should be ready. Because... He's coming, and he's coming quickly. And so John's response to that is this. You ready? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Just what Rick said. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so, come on. I'm ready, John says. I'm ready. Now, it's just a, a, I'm going to get into my conclusion in just a second. That's preacher talk, for I'll be talking for another 15 minutes. John the Apostle, according to tradition, was thrown into a vat of boiling oil. And it didn't kill him. So 
So they took him out of the vat of oil. I don't know what he looked like. Must have been pretty bad. And they put him on an island by himself, the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. And so John had been through a lot. He's the last living apostle. The rest have all been martyred. And he had been boiled in oil, put on an island, got this message, had to send the messages to the churches, had to write it all down for us so we would have an accurate record of what Jesus Christ said. And when Jesus said, it's all done, I'm going to come quickly, I can understand why John would say, come on. Back after Jesus rose from the dead, they're sitting at a lake shore. They ate some fish and were fellowshipping together with the disciples. And uh, Jesus is dealing with Peter and his abandonment of Jesus during the whole trial thing. And he's going through it with him. And he's telling him to uh, what his future is going to be like. And Peter looks over at John and says, what about that guy? What's he, what, what he got in store for him? And Jesus politely told him, it's none of your business. If I want him to stay alive until I come, that has nothing to do with you. And so there was a legend that came out that John was going to stay alive until Jesus came back. And I'm thinking after you're boiled in oil and thrown on an island and getting all this message, you might be believing that you're not going to die until Jesus comes back. And so his response is golden to me. Even so, come get me. Somebody feel like that in this room today? Even so, come get me. I'm ready, Lord. I want to be with you. I want to enjoy your company. I want to enjoy your peace. I want to enjoy your... I, I just want I just want to be with you. He's going to come in one of the two ways for you and me, either in judgment or in rescue. It's going to happen. He's going to do it because he said he was. So ask yourself this question. Are you ready? If my prayer was answered and he came right now, are you ready? Have you put your faith and trust in the crucified, risen Son of God? God wanted you to know how much he loved you. So he punished Jesus Christ for all of your sin. Nailed him to a cross. Treated him unmercifully. And he died on that tree. Put him in the grave. All finished. But God said, I want you to know that the person I sent is, in fact, my son, God in the flesh. And so three days later, out he came. And by that, God is testifying that everything Jesus said about himself and everything the Bible says about Jesus is true. I hope you're ready. <clears throat> Heavenly Father.